Hello everyone, welcome to Quincy in Focus, Quincy Access TV's news magazine show. My name is Jonathan Caleri and I'm being joined by Mark Crosby. Mark and I are part of the staff here at Quincy Access TV. This is our annual year in review show where we count down the top 25 stories covered on Quincy in Focus in 2017. And Mark, as always, a lot has happened in the city of Quincy this year. Well, a lot, a lot on the development uh, end. Uh, you can look at the Four River Bridge, you can look at the Wollaston T Station, mm -hmm. uh, just to name a few. So certainly that was an active uh, part of uh, 2017. It certainly was, and of course there are many of the annual favorite traditions that happen here in the city of Quincy as well. Thanksgiving football, the Harvey Saltwater fishing trip, and many other different things that happen here in the city of Quincy. And some other new things that happen here as well, including just outside the city of Quincy's borders in the city of Boston. And coming in number 25 is a Patriots Super Bowl rally in February hosted by the City of Boston at City Hall Plaza. And QATV member Sue Renard was there, camera rolling in the stands and in the crowd to celebrate the victory. about goats <laughs> and you all know we have the goat when it comes to player in Tom Brady we have the goats when it comes to coaches in Bill Belichick but I want all of you to know that my family and our organization feel we have the goat of fans on the planet. Let me tell you, these, these players, they worked harder than any, any team I've ever coached. They came to work every day, and there were no days off.
on something? When we get six, your boy right here is going to be part of six, baby. Let's go. Woo! This team worked so hard to be right here with them at. I love these guys so much. And I know I wasn't part of playing the game, but please, I love being part of this team. And this is just so amazing. And you guys are the best fans ever. Endicott College intern Brandon McDonald viewed this year's Quincy Recreation Department Arts and Craft Playground Projects and brings you number 24 on the countdown. We're here with Mallory DeVoe from the Quincy Rec Department, and uh, we're at the art fair. Mallory, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Now, uh, tell us about the uh, this year's art fair. So, we have 15 parks and one camp from around the city, and everyone is in charge of making um, like a big art project. And then we bring them all down to City Hall, and everyone votes on them, the public, the park, everybody. We count up all the votes, and we place them. It's a pretty good showing this year. You should check them out. Great. Now, how does the voting work? Um, you get a ballot, and you can pick your top favorite three. You don't rank them. You just put an X in the box, so you vote for three, technically. And kids can vote, leaders can vote, and then the public can vote, anyone that's around. All right, so uh, where do the parks get all the supplies for the, uh, the art? Most of the supplies we give to them if they request them. We have a lot of stuff that we can give to them, so that's how they get a lot of it. Uh, how long do they have to make these projects? We know about them from the start of the season, so they can really start whenever. Sometimes they start a little bit later, but they know from the first day when to start. Is there a theme to this? No. One year we did a theme. It was a little restricting, so no themes anymore. So um, have any counselors now gone through this process? Have, have they built any art before when they were, when they were in the camps? Yeah, there's a lot of kids that used to go to playgrounds that are now leaders. That's most of our leaders, actually. Um, and they've all grown up doing them. So it's nice that they have, like, an idea and they know how to do them and how to put them together and how big they need to be and all that stuff. So it's awesome having past rec kids do the projects. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time. Of course. Have a great day. You too. Curry College intern Sanjay Touré visited the Quincy Police Department for a demonstration on car seat installation. So a couple of things that we noticed with the seat was is the straps are a little bit below her shoulders. For forward facing, you want them to be at or slightly above. Um, the infant seat's a little bit of a different story. Second issue is the connection here between the two belts. You want it to be slightly higher, right about the chest plate. Um, the third issue is actually three and four is in conjunction together. The um, latch system that has the seat in place, which is this strap right here, it's twisted on this side. 
um, and it's really, really loose. So when you put the car seats in, you want them tight enough that there's no more than an inch of movement on either side. So we'll have Molly get out, I'll fix those problems, and then uh, we can put it back in and see how it looks. You gotta run these <coughs> shoulder straps through here so it's at or slightly above the um, shoulder blades. So a lot of times they get all um, tangled up, which is happening in this case. So you just run them right through the holes that match up in the back. We'll attach it again. We raise the level of the shoulder straps. So that's job number one. Take this, pull this nice and taut. You have to work out the kinks in the fabric while you're going through it. Make sure that the um, finger of it is pointing down where this is on the bottom. Take it, you put it right here, right where you see these little buttons. Under there, there's a U-bolt that's welded directly to the frame of the car. So that will go right there and then we'll tighten it on the other side. So the difference that we made here once she was in the car seat is that we moved the chest plate up slightly. So that's in the appropriate position. So in the event of a crash, when she moves forward, the bulk of the weight is going to be on this itself. So other than that, the seat's all set. It's in there nice and tight. We made the corrections. What we noticed with this seat is, is that it's loose. Um, there's a towel under here, which is fine to do. You can either use a towel or a pool noodle, but the only way you should use that is when uh, the, um, the tilt with the carrier, with the baby inside of the seat is off, according to the specifications of the seat and the maker of the seat. The third issue is, is that we have this mirror here. We don't want these things here. Uh, the reason is, is that in a crash, these seats are designed to be loose up the front, to dip down and come back like this. So the only way to see whether or not that towel is needed is to put the carrier in the base. I'll take this off too. So you replicate with this strap the same thing that you did with the other seat. Click it in there like that. Click it in there like this. You tighten it just like we did the other way. You're gonna want to use the owner's manuals for the seats that you have, which is really important because each seat is made differently. Why don't we put the carrier in and we can see how this looks. We took the towel out, which I explained is acceptable. Um, as you can see here, um, She's within range, so we don't need the towel. The towel is only to compensate for that. And uh, we took the mirror off, so when it crashes, her head won't hit the mirror. Coming at number 22 in our countdown, a President's Day celebration that seems natural for the City of Presidents. And that's exactly what happened this past February in Quincy Center with the first President's Day Winter Fest. Welcome, everybody, to Quincy, Massachusetts, the City of Presidents. This is the President's Day Winter Fest. Our first, by the way. So welcome everybody, there's a mobile gaming truck, if you like to play video games, you can go over there and play, you can go inside the truck and outside the truck. We have some historic reenactors here. This is the Church of the Presidents, by the way, which we recommend you coming to tour throughout the touring season. Two, one, yes. Her name's Julia Minicello, her dad is a local Quincy guy, born and raised, her mom is from Milton and they now reside in Canton, and this girl has a voice of an angel. Please welcome to the stage Julia Minicello. Give her a loud applause. Make it! 
It's where we post the most photos and videos and we're very active with our fans. If you are not following us on Instagram, you can find us at at 3D Official Music with the number 3. Next, we'll visit the polls for the final municipal election with Curry College intern Vanessa Rizzatano. Hello, my name is Vanessa Rizzatano and I am standing outside of one of the polling locations here in Quincy. Many people have made their way down to the polling locations in Quincy, including our governor, Charlie Baker, who had a meet and greet in front of one of the locations. What do you hope the turnout will be today? Well, I'm hoping for 25% um, turnout. It is a nice, brisk day out there, so hopefully people will get out to vote. Um, we, we wish for more, we prepare for everybody, but we're hoping for at least 25%. Okay, so what is the process after the polling locations close in Quincy? Um, so all the wardens and their police officers come back to City Hall, and uh, we tally the votes there at City Hall. Okay. So I know that Quincy Access Television will have unofficial results after the polls close. Can you tell me why they are unofficial rather than official? Certainly. Um, so after the polls close, there are some um, provisional ballots that are counted later. Um, everybody is um, able to get a provisional ballot when needed. Either their name isn't on the voting list or um, they, there's a discrepancy in their um, name or something to that effect. So we give them a provisional ballot and we'll find out um, in the next day or two if they are registered and we add their um, ballots to the tally at the end. Can you tell me about what you have received for absentee ballots? So um, we got about uh, 780 absentee ballots overall and those go out to the polling place um, within the next hour. We have um, teams of registrars in our city that will um, disperse from City Hall to the polling locations and they'll count the um, ballots at the local level. So is there anything else you would like to add like how the turnout is so far at this location or even other locations? So um, we did a 10 o'clock um, preliminary result um, and we came up with 5.46% um, had come out so far. So um, we, we will do another one at two. Um, so we're hoping for, you know, 12% by two o'clock and, and we'll see what happens from there. What direction would you like to see Quincy go in? Are there any changes to the city you would like to see happen? Um, I like to, I, a lot that's happening is good, but I think it needs to slow down a little bit. It's just too much all at once. In what way do you believe it should slow down? I think there just needs to be a little more thought and preparation of what's going on. I think too much got done, was started at, all at the same time. What brought you to vote here today? It's your right and it's your obligation to vote. If you don't like the way things are run, you have to change it with your vote. And luckily we still have that right. I think we live in a pretty good city and the changes that are about now are making the city look a lot better. And I think with our elected officials, they're doing a pretty good job at it. What brought you out here to vote today? It's a privilege and it's uh, something you should do. And are there any changes or improvements you would like to see made in Quincy? And if so, what are they? Lower my real estate taxes. 
all this building, why is my, aren't my taxes going down? Well, that's all. As you can see, I talked with a lot of voters today in Quincy discussing their concerns that they have for the city and what they would like to see changed. Make sure you'd make your voices heard and get out and vote. The 85th meeting between the Quincy and North Quincy football teams will be remembered as an all-time classic thanks to an action-packed fourth quarter and an exciting final 30 seconds. And it comes in at number 20 on our Top 25 Countdown. First possession of the game went to North Quincy and it's third along for the Red Raiders. Quarterback Tim Lady goes back to pass and finds a wide open Chris Donahue and goes all the way down to the President's 20-yard line, a 40-yard gain on third and long. That's going to set up a 31-yard field goal attempt for Karen O'Driscoll, but it goes wide to the right, so we remain scoreless. North Quincy gets the ball back, though, still in the first quarter at the President's 33-yard line, and Nate Sleem is going to get a big run here on third down for the Red Raiders, a 14-yard game, and that moves the chain for the Red Raiders. Now we're into the second quarter. Sleeman again. He's going to be at the Quincy 14-yard line running to the left. Looks like he's going to dive into the end zone, but he fumbles just before he crosses the goal line. It goes out of bounds, and it's a touchback President's ball. Sean Hortha now for the President's running the ball up the middle, and big hit there by North Quincy, and he fumbles. Connor and Chris Donahue and Alex Pham all there to force the fumble, and North Quincy recovers. Scoreless at the half, we move now to the third quarter. Quincy at their own 47-yard line. Colin Keevney looking to pass. It gets tipped to Andrew Rooney and finds Brendan Fitzpatrick for a big game. It is going to be a fourth and short now, and a big stop there by North Quincy. Hawthorne can't get through the line. Elmer Lanez and Alex Pham on the stop, and it returns over to North Quincy. The Red Raiders now at the 50-yard line, Layden looking downfield to Nelson Wallenjom, and a big possession there, a 26-yard pass to the President's 24-yard line. Handoff's going to go now to Nate Sleeman, running over to the right side, big break there of the tackle, and Sleeman gets up now to the President's 9-yard line. Next play is going to set up another pass to Wallenjom, Layden finds him, and it's going to be a 12-yard touchdown pass, and with a point after, North Quincy goes up 7-0 in the third quarter. Quincy gets the ball back, though, and they're going to give it to their workhorse, Sean Hawthorne, and another 19-yard run here for Hawthorne to get things going for the Presidents. Ball again goes to Hawthorne. This time it's an 11-yard run over to the left side and it goes into North Quincy territory. Again, they give it to Hawthorne. Big man on the drive here for the Presidents. Over to the right side, gets on the outside, and a 13-yard run for the Presidents. This time they're going to give Hawthorne a rest and they give it to Dominic Laptiste. He goes over to the left side for another 10-yard gain for the Presidents. Residence. We move now to the same possession in the fourth quarter, though, at the North Quincy 12-yard line. Sean Hawthorne back in the end, gets the ball, bowls over two players right there and goes into the end zone for a touchdown. Now the extra point attempt here to try to tie the ball game, and coming in was Nate Sleeman with a big block, blocks the extra point, and preserves North Quincy's lead at 7-6. Quincy gets the ball back at the North Quincy 33-yard line, and a great catch there by Andrew Rooney is going to set up a first and goal at the Red Raiders 10-yard line. Now at the North Quincy 2-yard line, it's fourth down. Colin Keevney looking to pass, nothing there. He's going to run it up the middle, but he's going to get stopped at the 1-yard line by Wallajom, Jake Ruse, and Devin Gano. It's a turnover and downs, and North Quincy holds. We now move to under a minute to go in the game. Colin Keevney at the Red Rays 8-yard line, running up to the right side. He's going to get all the way up to the 1-yard line with 43 seconds to go. Quincy has to spike the ball on second down. Now it's third down. Sean Hawthorne gets the ball and a good pressure there by Wynn Tran. And coming up to make the tackle is Tran and also Chris Donahue. And that brings up now a fourth down for the Presidents. Clock is continuing to tick. Quincy has no timeouts left. As Quincy gets up to the line, they're going to spike the ball thinking it's third down, but it's actually fourth down. And that's going to seal the ball game as North Quincy wins 7-6. to six. And Raiders! Congratulations to you all, principal and great coaches, but great players. Congratulations, city champs, North Quincy High School. North Quincy back-to-back -back champions on Thanksgiving Day. At number 19 on the countdown is the 66th annual Flag Day Parade and Ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've got, uh, of course, a great lineup again of marching bands and mm -hmm. honor guards. Uh, there'll be the, uh, mm -hmm. the fife and drum corps that always takes everybody by surprise, surprise yes. <laughs> with the musket fire. Right, uh, right. Blanks, not right. to worry. Yeah. Um, and then uh, all our public safety agencies, of course, mm -hmm. well represented. Mm -hmm. And just a great family event. Right. It's wonderful. You know, uh, folks come back every year, I know. Uh, yes, they do. Uh, 
And I, as I said, this is 66th. 66th, yeah, just yeah. hard to believe. Mm -hmm. uh, founded, of course, by Richard J. Koch, the mayor's right. father, back in 1951. Mm -hmm. um, started as just, you know, a bunch of little kids marching right. around Cavanaugh Field. Hey, coming into view next, you'll see some of our elected city officials. Yeah. Mm. Um, see Mr. Bruce Ayers, I believe. Our state, one of the state representatives, right. Lindsay delegation, yeah. Uh -huh. And the Grand Marshal of the Korean War veterans. Right. As I mentioned, with their own mm -hmm. float this year. Mm hmm uh, Graves Registration Officer George Bouchard there on the right. <laughs> shaking hands with Senator John Keenan. Oh, John Keenan. The Massachusetts 9th Regiment always wakes the crowd up. It does. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, they uh, date back many, many years, actually. Mm -hmm. It was a military unit from Boston during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Known as the Fighting 9th. Existed from 1861 to 64, and then mm. took part in several battles mm. when mm. it was originally formed. Mm -hmm. They are reloading now. So I hope they're not aiming at us. <laughs> 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 they're shooting blanks. Let's uh. <laughs> So the first Flag Day Parade actually occurred at Kavanaugh Stadium in North Quincy, started by uh, Dick Koch, who was a World War II veteran. It started with uh, just a couple of hundred kids, and it was later uh, transferred to the city center, ending at the stadium. And for many years now, it's been brought here to Marymount Park. And the highlight of the parade continues to be those young people who is the future, carrying old glory down the street. So how about for all those kids that did a great job coming down Haycock Street. Thank you kids for being so respectful to the flag. Out of the tradition that's been repeated every single year. Let the kids march in a parade, bring families and neighbors together for a free program in our wonderful city. Enjoy a hoodsie while we all honor our American flag. I am extremely proud of my role in helping to keep these vision alive, and I am deeply honored to have my name on the Richard J. Koch Youth Service Award. Thank you, and don't hesitate, recreate. The annual Veterans Fishing Trip, sponsored by the Harvey Saltwater Fishing Club, is one of the Quincy's best examples of honoring those who served our country. This year, 150 veterans took to the seas for a day of fishing, and it comes at number 18 on our countdown. So we're here with Mike Cheney from Harvey Saltwater Fishing Club to talk to us about the 61st annual uh, Harvey Saltwater Fishing Club uh, veterans outing. Mike, what a beautiful day it's going to be again. Absolutely a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day in a number of ways. Um, we have, we're expecting about 200 veterans. Um, we have about 150 here now. The boats, a lot of them are just starting to take off. Um, everything is going well. The weather is cooperating, thank goodness. So we're hoping it stays like this until we get them back in and feed them, feed the vets, you know. But we're really honored to be here. Um, this is our 61st year, and um, I've been honored to do it for about 40 years. And um, this year uh, is a special uh, year for us uh, because we have so many new vets that are coming back from overseas. And they don't all have, um, they don't have uh, all visual disabilities. Uh, some of the disabilities are, are, are impairments as a result of mental fatigue, et cetera. So uh, we're seeing a different kind of vet uh, than we have in the past 40 years. I remember World War I vets um, and now World War II. Um, but really, I just want to thank the volunteers, the sponsors, uh, everybody. They've been fantastic, you know. And um, this year we're honoring Bob Noble. 
our own Bob Noble, um, who was a uh, World War II veteran and a POW, 92 years old. And I asked Bob, Bob, as a guest of honor, uh, we're going to put you on the police boat. And he said, no, nah, I'd rather go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Bob Noble. So um, we're really honored to have uh, Bob uh, be our honoree this year and dedicate the event in his name. Um, it really is an honor for us to do that. So, uh, but it's a great day. It's a great day. Why is this so important for these guys to come out on this day every year? What, you know, what is it that, that they get out of it? Well, essentially for some of the disabled veterans, it's the only day they get out of the hospital. For many, if not all of the disabled veterans, it is the only day that they'll be able to go fishing in salt water. Um, it's th the logistics of pulling off an event like this. It's pretty extraordinary. You have fishermen who, um, who fish for a living, who give up their day of fishing uh, to provide the boats, and private boat owners that give up their day, and then 100 volunteers that give up a day of work. This is a 100% volunteer effort. Uh, we raise money from a dollar to buy one of those little fish and put your name on it, um, all the way up to a couple of thousand dollars for a major sponsor. Um, and that's how we pull it together. So it's remarkable that, you know, it's survived for 61 years. Has it always been here at Quincy Yacht Club? No, it was um, at Harvey's Wharf uh, years ago. It started out with um, a handful of fishermen from Harvey's um, who went to a local veterans hospital and transported them to Howe's Neck, took them out for a day of fishing. Their wives and some of the men cooked uh, dinner uh, for them. So when they came back fishing, they provided them with a home cooked meal. And that evolved and evolved, and more hospitals heard about it, more hospitals get involved, to the point now where we have uh, eight facilities that uh, are involved in this. On the Greater Boston area here? Yes, uh, Greater Boston area. Um, we actually reached out this year to Worcester, and um, they were going to see whether or not they could put it together to, to bring some veterans out. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Mike, really appreciate the time. Uh, good you. to talk to you. Thank you very much. Good seeing you. You're welcome. Well, the city of Quincy was visited by a caped crusader. I'm speaking, of course, of Donut Boy, who delivers donuts to police throughout the country. He did make a stop here at the original Dunkin' Donuts on Southern Artery. Yesterday was actually Tyler's one year anniversary and um, over the course of the past year, about a year ago, he met four deputies that he saw at a local store and he said, Mom, you know, cops' favorite drink is coffee and their favorite food is donuts, right? So of course we chuckled about it and he asked could he use his own money to buy them mini donuts. So um, when we left the store, they were just very thrilled over it. When we left the store, he asked me why they were so happy over something that was a snack. And I explained to him that, you know, officers were having a hard time right now and that a lot of people in the world unfortunately choose to judge a whole lot of you and if you do that you would never have anybody because we've all had a bad experience with a bad doctor or a bad teacher or really there's bad in every group so um, he said okay well I'm gonna thank every cop in America and buy them all a donut and of course I was like well what if we started locally and then we just see what happens because that's a really large goal and um, he was very persistent very adamant about the fact that he wanted to thank every single police officer in America so we started local it kind of snowball affected and uh, we're one year into the program 22,000 donuts delivered 16 states that we've been to and uh, it's just amazing it's amazing that we're being able to put kindness back into the world and you know reinstill the faith in humanity we really appreciate him coming out and showing his support I think it's a great thing for the, for the department and also what he's doing around the country how did the department first find out about Tyler? Uh, we found out through our uh, uh, information, public information officer. Um, she was notified that he was looking to come and <laughs> was looking to come and, and do this. So we were really appreciative that he picked us. There was a lot of police departments he could have picked, and we're glad he picked us, right? I gave him buddy ears. I know you did. Hi, I, I'm the donut boy. <laughs> That's how you're going to be known forever. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. What type of donut did he make you? It was uh, sprinkles with strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla. It was awesome. It was a great donut. Strawberry, chocolate, and sweet, uh, sprinkles. Was it the one with everything on yep. it? Yep. Yeah, a little strawberry, bit of everything. chocolate, vanilla icing, um, blue sprinkles, and Dunkin' Donut sprinkles. Yep. It was good. <laughs> what does it say to have a kid this young have such a you know great attitude towards boys? It's really refreshing to see it. You know, the next generation coming up, we encourage this, and you know, it's really encouraging to have a, a especially someone this young take the initiative and, and show the support that he's shown. So it seems like a great family, and we're thankful that they chose Quincy to come to come and visit with. Quincy Health Department took first place honors at the Alliance for Community Media's National Conference held this year in July in Minneapolis. In the Division of Access Center Professional Halloween Safety Tips, Ruth Jones and Mark Crosby, Quincy Health Department, Quincy Access Television, Quincy, Massachusetts. Trees that have not been inspected with water to help reduce the number of harmful germs on We're here in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Alliance for Community Media's annual conference. Uh, Ruth Jones is joining me. Uh, we had just uh, experienced the award ceremony. Uh, Ruth and I, uh, from the Quincy Health Department, of course, won an award in the mixed and transmedia category. It was for Halloween safety tips. Uh, Ruth, uh, talk just a little bit about this. Sure. So we had a lot of fun doing that, uh, that uh, skit on uh, Halloween safety. Um, we're glad to get that message out and we're so happy that um, they recognized uh, our part in this and, and it was a great ceremony and we're really proud to be here. So we will show you just a bit of that uh, piece that won the awards here at the National Convention. Enjoy. Hello. What an unexpected pleasure. How kind of you to visit. Whether you're a goblin or a ghoul, eating sweet treats on Halloween is devilishly fun. If you're trick-or-treating, health and safety experts say you should remember these tips. Trick-or-treaters should eat a snack before heading out, so they won't be tempted to nibble while out. Don't eat treats that have not been expected at home. Don't accept or eat anything that isn't commercially wrapped. Parents of young children should remove any choking hazards, such as gum, peanuts, hard candies, or small toys. Inspect commercially wrapped treats for signs of tampering, such as an unusual appearance or discoloration, tiny pinholes or tears in wrappers. Throw away anything that looks suspicious. Remember, sweets do have a shelf life. Chocolate that is past its expiration date may be extremely sticky or grainy, or the color or flavor may seem unusual. If you suspect candy is past its shelf life, throw it away! If you're having a Halloween party, follow these safety tips. Make sure any juice or cider being served is pasteurized. No matter how tempting, don't taste raw cookie dough or cake batter. Before bobbing for apples, make sure that the fruit is thoroughly rinsed off under cool water to help reduce the number of harmful germs on it. Scare bacteria away, keeping all perishable foods chilled until serving. Cold temperatures keep most harmful bacteria from multiplying. And don't leave the food at room temperature for more than two hours. Oh. It looks like they're having a Halloween party without me. How dare they! I'll get that chocolate and candy corn too. Lydia, take your army. Get them fly, fly! Oh, and by the way, make sure 
Before you eat your candy, you wash your hands. No, not me, no! I'm melting, melting, oh no, I'm melting! At number 15, it's Interfaith Social Services 70th Anniversary Recognition. Executive Director Rick Doan talks about the organization and its mission. My name is Rick Doan, I'm the Executive Director of Interfaith Social Services and here at Interfaith we are a one-stop shop for families in need. So we have a food pantry, mental health counseling center, we have eviction prevention programs, we have one of the best thrift shops on the South Shore, and we're here for when people need help. This year we're celebrating our 70th anniversary. So we were founded here in Quincy when the South Shore was going through a crisis. And over the years we have adopted programs uh, to help families in need, especially children. So one of the things that we've done over the past few years is found ways we can bring children more joy. So it's Halloween costumes that we distribute to hundreds of kids, it's Easter baskets, it's Christmas, it's back to school backpacks. Um, you know, our food pantry and some of our, our bedrock programs have been around for 40 years or 70 years, but something over the past few years that we've done is really added more programs to bring joy to the children that we serve. During the summer is one of our busiest times of the year. So during the holidays is when everybody in the community is thinking about hunger and we're grateful for it because we have a lot of clients who come in that need help that are trying to make ends meet and this time of year is extra difficult. You have a, a, a luxury meal like Thanksgiving where you have all those expenses that go into in a meal and you have Thanksgiving and Christmas and all of those things. But one of the busiest times that people don't think about is the summer. During the summer when kids are out of school they're not getting a free breakfast, they're not getting a free lunch, and families depend on our services to get help. We serve 10 towns on the South Shore. Uh, Quincy is one of the, the communities that most relies on our services. After that, it's Braintree, Weymouth, Randolph, but we serve all the way down to Hull, Cohasset, Situate. Um, we serve 10 towns in the greater South Shore area. We have two full-time employees and we have a number of part-time program managers, but we are unique in the fact that we rely heavily on volunteers. We have 120 volunteers coming in every week to serve at our front desk, in our food pantry, in our thrift shop. Volunteers uh, from corporate groups are coming in, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Arbella, Boston Financial, Quincy businesses uh, that really support us, they send 800 volunteers every year. Um, so we could not serve our clients without the volunteers who come in. So food comes from a variety of sources. About half of it comes from the Greater Boston Food Bank, which has a contract for federal and state food and large food salvage programs. We go in and we pick up uh, you know, about 5,000 pounds a week there. But the other half of our food comes from food salvage. So our food rescue van is out on the road five days a week going to uh, Big Y, to Roach Brothers, to BJ, to Stop and Shop, to Trader Joe's, to Star Market, going to all of these places, picking up food that otherwise would have gone to waste that we're able to bring to our clients. Also, donations from the community. We have people every day that walk into our offices with bags of food from their church, from community, from their family, and we need all of that working together to provide food for our clients. This is our 70th anniversary, and so we have our 70th, we're celebrating that with our 20th anniversary Feed the Hungry Gala, and that's coming up on December 8th. Um, and we have more information on our website, interfaithsocialservices.org. With many bridges across the state's highway system in a state of disrepair, MassDOT is turning to a new accelerated replacement program to update this system with as little impact on traffic as possible. One of the first instances was right in our backyard with the Route 3 Bridge Replacement Program, and it comes in at number 14. As you can see, the crews and contractors are working hard to prepare this location for construction operations that will take place this fall when the bridges will be replaced in their entirety in just two weekends. Uh, we at the Bass Dot Highway Division are, are in the people business. We are in the business of helping people get where they need to go and upgrading the infrastructure to give them reliable transportation. Um, we know that making those investments in our um, infrastructure, uh, paving, rebuilding structurally deficient bridges um, may not be the sexiest thing we can do, but it's among the most important. Uh, Mass Dot and the Commonwealth are at the tail end of an eight-year 
three billion dollar accelerated bridge program that in total has um, replaced over 200 structurally deficient bridges across the Commonwealth, including five mega bridge pro mega mega projects, including the Four River Bridge. Uh, for those of you who go a little bit further south, um, and one of the things we've learned in that process is um, how to deal with problems like the one you see behind us, which is two bridges, 113,000 cars a day going over those bridges, but underneath them a very busy ramp. And this project in particular, which involves some pretty interesting uh, construction techniques, which is basically a lift and replace approach, uh, is one that we've been using here in Massachusetts for almost 10 years, and I think it is a game changer with respect to the state's ability to move quickly on these kinds of projects and to do it in a way that minimizes traffic disruption. Um, and as I said, this doesn't work if you don't have strong local partners. Uh, and here in the city of Braintree, um, the mayor, Joe Sullivan, the city council, the DPW folks, they're terrific folks to work with. And uh, we really appreciate the local c contribution and collaboration that we get on projects like this. I think the number one deterrent uh, of our economy truly has become the issue of gridlock. Uh, and we need to work through that in a way that's going to be comprehensive in a way that is going to be uh, productive, not only for our transportation program, but how it links in to our economy. And with the governor's leadership, uh, we're making those steps. As a member of the Mass Dot Board, with the leadership of Secretary Pollack, with Lieutenant Governor Polito, we're taking those steps in a much more pronounced way over the last couple of years, and we have a significant capital improvement plan that is in place uh, and that we're working on. This $6 million project, uh, again, as the Secretary mentioned, we, we have used a lot of the lessons learned over the last few years of uh, ABP, and we're applying a lot of accelerated bridge techniques to make sure that projects like this and several others that you'll be hearing about in, in, uh, in several weeks are not going to be as disruptive as traditional bridge projects were. There's still a place for those traditional bridge projects, but when you get onto a really busy roadway like this and you have an opportunity to approach the job differently and use some in this case, pre, uh, precast elements to make sure that the project gets into place quickly and easily without disrupting the public for months and months on end and instead having a uh, quick hit, tear the Band-Aid off approach. It really is a benefit to everybody in the long run. And number 13 on our Top 25 countdown is the construction beginning on a new 140 unit development called the Watson in Quincy Point. The site was used by Governor Charlie Baker to announce that he will seek over $1 billion in funding for affordable or workforce housing projects. What is the Watson? The Watson is 140 units. It's going to be new construction. This building behind us will be coming down and in its place will be a new building and parking for uh, 86 middle income and workforce units, 28 affordable units and 24 market rate units. What's unusual about this project is the first uh, component I named, 86 middle income units. That type of scale just doesn't happen anywhere. It doesn't happen in any city, and we work in a lot of them across the country. It takes tremendous leadership to identify the need for the middle income and then actually to do something about it. 1.25 million out of the Affordable Housing Trust some community preservation money, which is on the table now, and some home monies for about a half a million dollars. So we're approaching $2 million of commitment from the city of Quincy, uh, which is a part of, I know, a number of contributions to make this happen. Uh, historically, this is a part of our city that we saw, as uh, many of you know, heavy industry. It is a shipyard here that during World War II pumped out uh, more ships, I think, than any ship in the country. More than 30,000 people that worked across the street round the clock during the war effort. So the shipyard has a, has a great... Uh, a deal of history in, in the city of Quincy. It's also kind of the last frontier. Uh, other parts of our city have adjusted from that manufacturing side uh, to the service industry and a more robust residential uh, city. So this is a great project that's going to make a major difference in this neighborhood and we look forward to its completion. We've actually substantially increased our commitment to safe, stable, affordable housing here in Massachusetts. We've committed to 1.1 billion in affordable and moderate rate housing development. Uh, and our capital plan over the course of the next five years, that's about a 20% increase uh, over previous efforts, which represents almost $200 million in additional contributions. Um, there are sort of three pieces to this. One is to build and preserve more low-income units. Second is to commit more resources 
to preserving and modernizing public housing for families and seniors, and the third is to provide housing for homeless residents and those at the risk of becoming homeless. But today we're here to talk about leveraging housing for uh, multiple uh, purposes. Uh, certainly this is economic development. When you, as Jay Ash will often say, put more people in an area, they need more services and more restaurants and more places to go. That is, in essence, economic development. Uh, for this project, it certainly is workforce development. And what I love about the whole model of this kind of workforce development is it's an opportunity for people in this community, perhaps younger people uh, who are trying to find uh, a price point for housing that works for them in a city that's so close to one of the best cities in the world, they will find Quincy a place where they can lay their roots. And the true measure of success, as I often say, is when that next generation can lay their roots even deeper in a community in which they were born and raised. And certainly a, a project like this allows that uh, to happen. I can say our shared values because I know that when I sit with the governor and the lieutenant governor, uh, this reflects their values. Um, I can say our shared values because I know when I sit with members of the legislature and we talk about uh, the need to support affordable housing and people who need it, um, it reflects our shared values. I know it because when I meet with mayors like Mayor Koch and others around the Commonwealth uh, who prioritize a community development agenda that includes provisions for affordable housing, I know it's about shared values. And I know it's about shared values because of the conversations uh, so many of us have had in trying to create affordable housing and trying to overcome the barriers that uh, residents have to uh, maintaining affordable housing as a way to getting on to a, a better and more prosperous life. A record number of recruits joined the Quincy Fire Department this year. QATV was there in a room filled with family and friends. I think it's uh, rather appropriate today we, we come together and uh, we celebrate. Each, each of your families are very happy today, uh, obviously. And the fire department uh, is very much like a family. I think it's probably more than any other I've seen uh, in the uh, other unions, other areas of, of uh, service, but the fire service that truly is that camaraderie uh, and that family, if you will, that family of firefighters. That doesn't mean that, as we know with families, there isn't some battles and fighting that goes on from time to time, uh, but truly the fire service comes together as a family. Uh, and as mayor of the city, I'm so proud of our fire service. The, the service that's delivered by our professionals uh, is second to none. With eight firehouses, the rescue service, uh, you know, those calls that come in, uh, no matter what the call is, uh, it's not just house fires, um, it's medicals, it's car accidents, it's, it's uh, chemical spills, hazmat, I could go on and on, but it's the fire service on the front line uh, all the time uh, serving the residents of the city. So you are joining a very good fire department. Uh, uh, it's been a long road. We started this process in May of last year, and... Uh, with the mayor's foresight, uh, we've been able to put this big group together, and uh, I expect them to be successful in their training. And uh, on or about June, we'll have them out in the street and on the trucks. To you gentlemen, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the rest of the day after you've been sworn in. <laughs> be prepared for, to work Monday morning. You have an awful lot to learn. Uh, we have a great group of instructors that are going to be there for you and coach you along the way. And I suspect and I expect that every one of you will be in full uniform when we have our graduation. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, in my almost 40 years on the department, I just about, I can't describe how rewarding it is. We see people in the most difficult hours of their lives, people that are doing all the right things, and they're faced with some tragedy. And from the moment we get on scene, we do everything that we can to lessen their burden. And I'll tell you, it is an honor to do that. This is the best department uh, in the country, and you guys are gonna be an integral part of it. So congratulations, and uh, welcome aboard. The rules and regulations of the Constitution. The rules and regulations of the Constitution. And the laws of this Commonwealth. The laws of this commonwealth and the ordinances of the city of Quincy. And the ordinances of the city of Quincy. So help me God. So
and we'll be looking forward to uh, a graduation a few months away. Uh, so let's have another round of applause for our new candidates. Congratulations, gentlemen. The 400th anniversary of the settlement of Quincy will be in 2025, and in preparation for this milestone event, Mayor Thomas Koch formed Quincy 400, a committee tasked to get input on not only how to celebrate, but where residents want Quincy to be in 2025. This really is uh, the beginning of a conversation, a conversation with, between all of us, with all of us, uh, with the idea that we involve every person that wants to be involved, every part of our city, every neighborhood, to engage, to listen, to participate, and to create and mold what we want the city to be going forward. And that doesn't mean it's uh, something etched in stone. This is going to be continued evolution, if you will, uh, that we're looking forward to, to start. As I say, it's the beginning of a discussion. We want to touch all aspects of, of civic life. We're going to have six themes we're starting with. Um, and uh, we're, listening to, we're going to be listening to a lot of community input. Those themes may vary and change a little bit. Maybe some things get added to it as we have this conversation and engage uh, folks of our, of our great city. So the first step out of this is going to be a number of community meetings that are listed on the rec card. And that will be the first uh, engagement, one-to-one uh, -one engagement. People can go to www.quincy400.com. If they can't make a meeting or they want to weigh in sooner than waiting for a meeting, you're welcome to do it uh, in that light. We want, obviously, um, we want input. We want involvement. This is an opportunity for people to truly get engaged. This isn't about an administration, an individual. This is about our community. This is about each and every neighborhood and each and every individual that cares uh, about our city. And I know so many folks out there do. Um, so the timeline, we're looking at some workshops to start between May and June. Uh, and we're looking in the fall out of the workshops this spring and out of the results of the surveys, we're looking this fall to put together some committees based on the categories I talked about. We're going to be asking folks that have particular interest in some of those areas if they'd be interested to serve. Uh, and then we'll have some folks that will lead those committees and facilitate further meetings uh, out in the public to vet some of the ideas and certainly come up, hopefully, with, with some of those solutions. And at the, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to be looking at a report. Uh, the first drafts will be out in uh, fall of 2018. Uh, and then from there, we'll continue to uh, update it, refresh it, and uh, start to move for impl implementation. Implement implementation could be, in some cases, next year, some cases two years from now, in some cases 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, there'll be a lot to this, so we've we, we got to certainly be practical and realistic on the implementation. But I do believe that it's time we have uh, a plan going forward, a bit of a roadmap to tie in the celebration of our city um, with the 400th, but really, as we talked about, creating, sustaining that community that, that we love. I think it's an exciting time for our city, and you can't help but feel it in this room, the sense of history. And it's not just a sense of history, it's a sense of responsibility. And that baton's been passed to us. And it's our job and our responsibility to the very best so that the next generation can enjoy and sustain the community that we've loved and enjoyed. The second annual Porch Fest Quincy was held in June this past year, and once again, it exceeded expectations. Over 75 musicians played in Wollaston, Marymount Squanum, and Beechwood Knoll, and it cracks the top 10 at number 10 of our Top 25 Countdown. Ain't you the sun shines and I don't know where well I'm stuck in balls and prison I keep dragging on Oh, that train keeps rolling On down to San Antonio When I was just a baby My mama told me so Always be a good boy, always clean your guns well. I shot a man in Reno, it was just a fight. When I hear that whistle blowing, I hang my head and cry. There's cash in the fire. Can make cash and fill themselves. This is gonna roll, go higher and higher and higher. Never fall without help. Why have been here for a long time? You can't still say it is wrong, but now it is only mine. You take out the third wheel. Baby, try to hold 
real flame At any rate, it's my own And then I see my real name Well, I went off track Went off track, I ain't come back from mine In the top 10, coming in at number 9, the Korean War Ambassador for Peace medal ceremony that was held in Quincy along with other South Shore towns. Korean War veterans were honored for their service and sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. My name is George Nicholson. I'm the Director of Veteran Services for the City of Quincy, and I am honored to be able to host this particular occasion so that the people of the Republic of South Korea can pay honor and a special little debt of recognition, which to them is eternal to the Korean War veterans that we have here today. Uh, it's, it's certainly an honor and privilege to serve as the mayor of this great city of Quincy. And every time I come in this room, it's, um, it's hard not to think about the great history uh, that this room invokes. And, you know, you, you look out the window in the burial ground of our, our forefathers out here. Uh, across the street, the presidents are buried. And, and certainly this room, since 1844, uh, people of all walks of life have come through this building to serve their city. Many of them served their nation, going back to the Revolutionary War. In fact, the first mayor of Quincy was a Civil War veteran, a decorated Civil War veteran. So. There's great pride in the city of Quincy and great tradition in honoring our veterans. Uh, and today is another example of that. So we're grateful to, again, the government of South Korea for acknowledging the incredible sacrifice made by the veterans from the United States to protect freedom for the people of South Korea. And certainly as mayor, on behalf of the citizens of the city of Quincy, I want to say thank you for your service. Many of the uh, Korean War veterans we met uh, during this year, they memorized one or two Korean words. Uh, one is 안녕하세요, which means, anybody remember 안녕하세요 among Korean war veterans? Okay, it, it is a hi. And uh, 감사합니다, it's a thanks. So I'd like to say 안녕하세요, 감사합니다, which means hello, thank you. Uh, we are doing this presentation of Ambassador for Peace Medal in honor of our Korean War veterans, not only in the United States, but also around the world. Countries that participated in 1950 Korean War. We all believe that democracy and freedoms of the, we enjoy today should be something that is shared around the world beyond us. It is true that if you have a democracy, you have a free country, you have a strong economy, and you have people who are willing to engage other people around the world, and engage in trade, and education, and communication. And I did a visit to Korea in 2014 as an official uh, guest of the Korean government, and it was quite enlightening to see how much they are like us and how much they are not. They adopted many things of the rest of the world, but in heart, they are truly Korean, holding on to their culture, their people, their language, and even a desire to be one country again. I'm very honored when George asked me to say a few words here today. 
As he said, the American Legion, being the largest veterans, war veterans organization in the world, and in Seoul, Korea, we have three American Legion posts that are situated in Korea. Those veterans that have gone back home that served with us during the war, in our side of the war, they form Legion posts like they do here in Quincy with the Morissette and the Squanum and House Neck, Quincy. So we're very much a part of the Korean establishment. Construction on a new Wallace and MBTA station is set to begin in January of 2018. But several meetings were held this past year to inform residents about the timeline and how their commute will be disrupted. And one such meeting comes at number eight on our Top 25 Countdown. I want to be very honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you tonight. I know you've all been to public meetings where folks have stood up and said, everything's going to be great, it's going to be just like it always was. Well, I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, we're going to do our best to get everyone to where they have to go in a timely and efficient and safe manner. But I'm not going to tell you that the shuttle buses are going to exactly mimic the red line. Uh, these will take a little more time, so we're asking everyone to please be as patient as possible. We know people have to get to work. We know folks have to get home from work. We know folks have to get to daycare and family dinners and school. Uh, we're going to do our best to get everyone there as, as best and as safely as we can, but I'm not going to stand here today and tell you it's going to be just like it, it, it would be with the red line is operating. When the red line is not running, we're going to run a shuttle bus between North Quincy Station and Braintree Station along local roads here in Quincy. The shuttle bus is going to depart North Quincy Station from the busway on Hancock Street. It's going to take a right-hand turn on Hancock Street. It's going to follow Hancock until a stop at Hancock and Woodbine Street. It's going to continue on Hancock Street, make a right-hand turn onto Beale Street, and service a new stop at Beale and Greenwood. Uh, after that, we're going to come up and uh, at the top of Beale and Newport make a stop there. So we hope that these uh, bus locations will get folks where they have to go. Um, we have contracted with a uh, local bus company called Yankee Lines to provide this shuttle service. I should mention that uh, the shuttle buses are free. There's no fares charged when you get on the shuttle bus at any time, uh, and at North Quincy, the fare gates are, are operating. There are times, or there, there certainly will be times during the project when the red line will continue to operate but will not stop and service Wollaston Station. Um, Wollaston Station will be closing on January 2nd, and at that time, in order to get folks from where they, they live near the station to where they, back to the red line, we're proposing to run this shuttle route. It's uh, very similar, or exactly similar to uh, what we proposed for the other shuttle when the red line is not running. The difference is uh, when the red line is running, the buses will turn right and loop back to North Quincy Station via Newport and West Quantum. So this we propose to run starting um, when the red line would operate, about 5 o'clock in the morning. We're working with our service planning team to get the number of buses. We tell the contractor how many buses to put out there. Uh, we estimate we're going to have up to 20 to 25 buses during the peak times, during the rush hours, running uh, on this loop or some variant thereof to make sure that we can carry everybody. So why January? Why are we closing the station in January and, and not wait until the spring um, because of the winter? Number one, it's a contractual requirement. The contractor has to start on January 2nd in order to meet the contractual milestone in August of 2019 to uh, finish, substantially complete the job. The construction duration is of length 20 months that it would um, be in a winter no matter what we're looking at. And finally, um, it's just the sooner we start, the sooner we'll be finished, and the sooner the Wallaston community will have a brand new station that's uh, fully accessible to all. Parking at Wallaston Station is, we're going to have upwards of 438 parking spots that remain. At number seven, it's Mayor Thomas Koch's State of the City address. The first, 
during the new four-year mayoral term. Some nine years ago, we faced the most serious economic crisis since the Great Depression. Property values were sinking, unemployment was rising, the future was uncertain. We made difficult choices, but we protected our core public services. Undaunted, we made investments, creating hundreds of jobs and building schools and new infrastructure at a moment when our economy desperately needed it. At the same time, we budgeted conservatively. And that work paid off. Today, property values in the city have recovered. All of the value lost during that Great Recession, and then some. Property values are rising faster here than almost any of the 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth. While we continue to compare favorably to communities across the Commonwealth, that doesn't mean we ignore, ignore the reality of what rising property values means to the taxpayer. In the last two years, with the support of the City Council, we have used $6 million in revenue surpluses to help offset that burden. We must continue to be mindful of those factors as we go forward, focusing our attention on new commercial growth and continuing to budget conservatively. While we continue to make important capital investments in our schools, public safety departments, and infrastructure, the budget for the upcoming fiscal year will hold the line on spending with very few, if any, new programs. Today, we have a great group of energetic police officers, both young and experienced, most of whom grew up right here in Quincy and care very much about its future. They are passionate about the city and its shows. Over the last 10 years, crime is down in almost every category. Since 2008, burglaries are down 50%, robberies down 32%, car thefts down 37%, and overall incident reports are down more than 12%. Even minor issues, such as vandalism, are down 35%. Like any city, we're not immune to crime or a rash of specific issues from time to time, or even year to year. But the unmistakable trend is we're going in the right direction. We will submit to this council this year a comprehensive park improvement plan that will cost our taxpayers not one dime. The city's economic growth has created substantial available revenue in our home rule tax, uh, hotel room tax fund. That's a surcharge paid by visitors to our city. The new revenues will free up enough financing for the completion of the next phase of the Hancock Adams Green, the first steps in a transformational improvement at Marymount Park, the city's first dog park, and projects at parks across the city, as well as a tree planting program. Our planning department and Department of Inspectional Services do great work in guiding development in the right places. Look at the major projects that have taken place around our city. Bergen Parkway, Crown Colony, Quarry Street, Marina Bay, Quincy Center, the North Quincy T, and the Forvey Shipyard. These are the places we want new growth and development. And these are the places where it is happening. Today, we're making more progress in our downtown than we have in decades, although we have much more work to do. This year, the next phase of development in the Hancock lot will continue to come together with this month's council approval of the real estate agreement, permitting the city's first 15-story building to be built by Peter O'Connell. As we continue to capture this time of great economic development, traffic and parking issues remain the most frequent concern raised by neighborhoods throughout the city. In the coming weeks, We'll be before the City Council with a request for the first citywide transportation plan in at least 25 years, including traffic, parking, pedestrian, and bicycle issues. With the assistance of a professional engineering firm, we'll be looking at signal timing, intersection improvements, neighborhood parking rules, pedestrian safety, and bicycle access in a comprehensive master plan that will be carried out in the years to come. Congressman Stephen Lynch appeared on Currently in Quincy with Joe Catalano to talk about hot-button issues in Washington this past year. The interview, taking place shortly after the inauguration of President Donald Trump, discussed the new Trump presidency and how divided Congress is. And it comes at number six on our Top 25 Countdown. You know, how would you kind of categorize the, the mood well, in Washington? Well, I, I think the initial, what is it? what has it been, five weeks yeah. uh, of the Trump administration. I think there's been high anxiety down there okay. uh, because of the rollout of the, uh, uh, of the various executive orders. Uh, and then sort of the retrenchment, there's been fits and starts. Uh, he's done some things and then pulled back. So, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it, it's been one of anxiety and trepidation, I think. 
I'm hoping that we can focus on a few issues that there might be some unanimity on. Mm -hmm. uh, tax reform, mm -hmm. I think that's something that the Democrats and the Republicans uh, have a general agreement on that, that we should be able to uh, get together on. Uh, the infrastructure issue, I think everyone agrees, especially New England, we have an older, <coughs> an older uh, area of the country. There, there's a way to tie that, that tax reform issue. If we repatriated some of this money that's overseas right now, held by U.S. corporations, and, and allowed them to repatriate it back into the United States at a modest interest rate, I think they're talking 13, 14 percent, that would give us about a trillion dollars over 10 years. And that would allow us to do a major infrastructure project from coast to coast for, uh, you know, for seawalls, you know, from harbors, uh, roads and bridges, all those, you know, parking garages, MBTA, uh, you know, commuter rail, all of that. It would give us a, a real boost. And it's been a while since we did that, not mm -hmm. to mention what it'll do for jobs. Social security, will it remain solvent? Um, right. does, it, does it need to be fixed? Um, there's been talk about maybe changing it into a voucher program as opposed to a beneficiary program. Yeah, that's a, that's a Paul Ryan idea, right. uh, you know, who's now the Speaker of the House, so he's, he's trotting that out again. Personally, I, I oppose that. Okay. If we had done that, the last time it was suggested back in the, in the Bush administration, in 2003, I think it was, uh, that money would have been on the, the Social Security money would have been on the stock market when it went in the toilet uh, in 2008. Right. We would have lost trillions of dollars, and I think now Social Security would have been at risk had we done it back then. Millionaires, billionaires pay the same amount into Social Security that average citizens pay. And, and I think that's wrong. Okay. You know, I think there should be a sliding scale. If you're making a million dollars, you should pay a little bit more than the people, you know, who are making fifty thousand dollars. And I think if you if you expand the limit at which you pay Social Security tax, that ceiling, I think you can extend right off the bat just by doing that one mechanism, and it's not onerous. You you would extend Social Security by fifty to seventy years in terms of uh, its solvency. We don't rely as much on coal anymore. We rely more on natural gas. Uh, these high pressure lines are being brought into the city. And, uh, you know, that's what we're seeing in West Roxbury. That's what we're seeing in, in Weymouth, where this, this uh, compressor station is meant to, to pump that gas along. Uh, I, I think it's a terrible idea, and, and we got into court to stop it uh, on, on uh, the West Roxbury uh, uh, project in, in Weymouth. Uh, we have also gone before FERC asking them to, to reverse their decision. Mm -hmm. um, but all of, the, all of the power under the uh, Natural Gas Act of 1931 is really with FERC, the regulatory agency, and, and with the gas companies. And that's, that's very, very, very unfortunate because I think it puts the public at risk because of the way they're, they're building these facilities very close to residential uh, homeowners. So. Coming at number five on our top 25 countdown is Rob Hale, the president and CEO of Granite Telecommunications. Hale was the keynote speaker at the Quincy Chamber of Commerce annual meeting. Hale spoke about his successes and failures in business and also about the purchase of key land in downtown Quincy as part of the redevelopment of Quincy Center. Uh, like everybody else, I had the choice of where we were going to establish our headquarters. And we were drawn to Quincy in 1990 for the same reasons that we are drawn to Quincy today. There is an educated, intense, diverse community here. The T brings that city closer to us. This is, this is a place that can foster and grow companies. And the name Granite does symbolize our allegiance to Quincy. It's bedrock, it's solid. It represents this town where good things had happened to us. So all telcos then and now, they generally go with names that denote speed and kind of sexiness like Lightship and Lightyear and all, you know, like stuff like that. We didn't want that. We wanted stability. We wanted, we wanted something that suggested sturdiness. We wanted what Quincy represented. So our name reflects our commitment to this community. And so in the last 15 years, We've created 1,800 jobs, American jobs, 
1,400 of them are in North Quincy. Fox Rock is, is our real estate development business. Uh, just a couple facts about Fox Rock. We're about eight years old. Over the last eight years, we have bought or developed about 32 buildings, about two and a half million square feet. Uh, with the exception of three buildings, they're all on the South Shore. As, as many of you know, we just bought Quincy Hospital. Uh, my opinion is Quincy Hospital right now is not something that Quincy can be proud of. And my guess is 50 years ago, it was a big part of, that communi of our community. Well, we're going to restore its luster. That, that's what we're here to do. We intend to keep it medical. We intend to supplement. We intend, honestly, to replace the existing facility, medical facility. We intend to upgrade it. We intend to add more medical. And, and that's a beautiful building. And it's a beautiful part of Quincy if it's well cared for and properly populated. We intend to do both. We intend to help build and restore the grandeur that, that Quincy had. And we intend to do it relatively quickly. Our goal is to build about a million square feet of Class A office and medical space in downtown Quincy. And our goal is for us, because as I mentioned, we intend to own these buildings. We don't intend to buy them and sell them. We intend to own them. For us and you to be proud of what we build together. Because there's a lot of us that are going to have to do this in the next five, six, seven years. Before the Four River Bridge opened, there was a series of press conferences held updating the progress along the way. Coming in at number four, it's the traffic lane reduction announcement. We have hit a point where a critical stage in the project, the bridge is done, it's ready to go, but we need to start connecting all the connecting ramps and roadways to it. So this will require us to begin a shifting traffic, shifting traffic off of the temporary bridge while we conduct these operations, which will lead to the following traffic impacts. Starting on the evening of June 2nd and lasting throughout the summer until September 1st, there will be just one lane of traffic in each direction on Route 3A over the Four River Bridge at all times. We're also strongly urging drivers to consider using any one of a variety of mass transit opportunities available to them. Drivers coming into Boston can choose to drive over to an MBTA ferry terminal that's less than a mile down the road from where we are standing right now. The terminal has a very large parking lot with excess capacity during the regular week, so there's no problem with parking. And the ferry ride itself is only a short 30 minute trip or so into Boston. Current bus routes that currently are using the bridge are going to continue to use the bridge throughout this process. In addition, drivers can also choose to get into Boston on the commuter rail as there are many station stops in this general area. Once this summer phase is completed and starting September 1st, we're going to have three lanes of traffic available to the, to the commuting public. And uh, what that means is that we're going to utilize a, a zipper style lane in the middle so that we can adjust traffic patterns depending on the time of day to accommodate those peak traveling hours during rush hour. So on the morning commute, we're going to shift traffic. Again, this is going to be starting September 1st. We're going to shift traffic so that there's two lanes inbound into Boston area. And in the afternoon, we're going to do the opposite so that there's two lanes outbound. So north in the morning, south in the, in the evening. By October 1st, so one month later, we anticipate that the progress that, that, uh, that our contractor has been able to make through this process will enable us to achieve full beneficial use of the bridge. That means all four travel lanes, starting October 1st, will be flowing in each direction, so we will, we will have the full bridge available to us. Drivers who do choose to drive all the way in are also encouraged to use all the variety of tools that are out there available then to, to predict how long their trip will take. We have our, of course, MassDOT's Mass511.com. There's also our GoTime travel app that they can download for smartphones. Or, of course, you can use Waze or Google Maps in order to help you make an informed decision on when you should leave to get to your destination on time. Additionally, we have identified a most likely alternate route for drivers. This route's going to include, uh, I'm sorry, this route involves traveling between Quincy and Weymouth via the southern, ar southern artery, Quincy Avenue, Commercial Street, and North Street. 
MassDOT is proactively working to optimize traffic flow through all the intersections on that route I just described by adjusting the timing of signals to better help accommodate additional vehicles. As part of our ongoing commitment to minimizing the impact of the traveling public, MassDOT has carefully selected this window of time during the summer to coincide with the lower traffic volumes expected during the summer months. As always, we appreciate the patience and understanding of the traveling public. I think they all realize that this is a very important project and it's going to make their lives easier in the long run. This new bridge is going to require less maintenance work that requires, uh, that requires lane reductions and traffic impacts unlike the current one does now. We will have a faster opening and travel, traveling meaning for fewer delays for drivers, which will also minimize tra no traffic noise across the bridge and it will not have the weather-related problems that the existing bridges had historically. Quincy Access Television in 2017 celebrated 20 years as an organization. Naturally, we celebrated with family and friends, members joining us for a special recognition celebration. That comes in at number three on our countdown. I want to thank everybody that has been involved with the good news over the years. It means a lot to the people that work on it, and it means a lot to the people who stay home, who can't get to church, and it's very, very, very meaningful to everybody. Thank you so very much. God bless. Denying it. A lot of times when you walk through life, people don't understand your experiences, but community access can give you a platform to show and share your experiences, not just with Quincy, but the world. And so I recommend that anybody comes down, takes the course with Bill, learns about how to use the equipment, and then puts their voice forward to the members of our community and show them what's important in your life. No one can do it for you. You have to do it by yourself and with your friends. And so many more friends that I've made here because of community access, whether it's a football game or graduations, and I've probably seen a lot of the graduates go through and I have no children. Um, this has been a wonderful forum to make friends and spread the word about just little things you've seen and done. And anybody can do these things, anybody can witness these things, and anybody can be informed if they can't leave their house. It's exciting in that manner, and I hope it goes on for many, many years to come, a hundred more years to come. So God bless you all, and thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I um, enjoy being a member, a volunteer member at QATV and helping members produce their shows. Uh, Faces of South Asia with Isha and Sophie, and. Constitution then and now with Don Casa, he's been doing his show maybe 15 years and uh, it's very, very rewarding. I want to thank uh, Betty Campbell, uh, the, the crew at QATV, they're, they're always willing to help uh, you run into a problem and they straighten it out and you get a successful show produced and it's, uh, everybody's happy. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and uh, thank you for this award. Thank you. Thank you so much, but just thank you to Betty and all, all the people here at the um, studio that help us out, but especially to my friend over here, Peter Leal, who uh, does a show with you every week. <clears throat> I call Peter up, and Peter can come in, as John was saying earlier, Peter can come in anytime, anytime you ask him to, and he's really great. And also, I, wanted to, I, got, I brought my friend with me tonight, my liberal friend down here, Jack, that's on my show once in a while. <laughs> he was down there beating me up earlier, but uh, we were talking about the... Um, what were we talking about, Jack? Oh, yeah, Marbury versus Madison. He always says Marbury. It's Marbury. But anyways, um, I want to thank, every, uh, thank you for the award. And remember, the Constitution is very important. We're letting it go away. And as I like to tell everybody, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, and the Fourth Amendment. It's the only amendments. And go home tonight and take a look at it. But they're the only amendments that say the right of the people. So once we let that go, and once we allow them to keep piling on, and those are the ones they're always going after. They're always going after your religion, your freedom of speech, your Second Amendment, which is your firearms, and your Fourth Amendment, which is being home secure in your papers. They're always coming after those three. And if we keep allowing them to do it, then we're gonna have nothing. Thank you. 
It's been quite a ride the past 16 months for North Quincy High School science teacher Kara Pekarsik. A research trip to Antarctica, new lessons and experiences to share with her students, and being named the Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. All in a day's work for Kara Pekarsik. And it comes at number two on our Top 25 Countdown. And every year we want to run a competition to identify our state teacher of the year. It's a tough competition. You have to win among about 80,000 teachers in the state. Massachusetts leads the nation in elementary and secondary education. So not only are we at the top of the 50 states, but our teachers are the best of the best. So the fact that we're here today in North Quincy High School to announce the next Massachusetts should tell you something about the quality, the effectiveness, the dedication, the commitment of the teachers in this building. It gives me great pleasure to announce that the 2018 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year is, as some of you have already guessed, Kara Bakarsik. <laughs> today has the opportunity for the very best education. We are also known as the most innovative state in the country. That means for you to understand the subjects like science, technology, math are really important for this economy in Massachusetts and for you. A job is an opportunity for you to solve problems. The job is an opportunity for you to be passionate about something that you love. Ms. P loves what she does. Imagine being able to study the demographics and behavior of whales. I mean, not many of us can say that we've done that, right? But through Ms. P, you've learned about that. And you've learned of the endless possibilities that are right there for you in the future. We are quite blessed, Governor Baker and I, to have you as one of our own and to be not only a role model and an example to the students, but to your colleagues in education. I am fortunate to come to work each day to collaborate with such amazing educators. The success of our students and the positive morale of the school is a direct reflection of the hardworking, dedicated community of teachers here at North Quincy. Without a doubt, my biggest thanks goes to students here at North Quincy High. There is kindness, respect, and empathy in this group of students. I'll admit there are days that both my students and I find frustrating. But more often than not, the days are filled with laughter and learning. I hope that my students know how much they mean to me, and that there isn't a day that goes by that I don't worry about them, and that I don't care deeply about them. Whether a student from 10 years ago or a young man or woman in my classroom just this morning, I will always remember the impact that each one has had on me as a teacher, but more importantly, as a person. The superior educator has consistently shared so much of what she knows with so many of you as students as well as colleagues. We all benefited from her dedication, her expertise, and her inherent ability to connect with the hearts and minds of her students and her colleagues and so many within our community. I want to congratulate the 2018 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year from North Quincy High School, Kara Picasso. Well, 24 stories are down, and Mark, that means there's one remaining. It's a top story covering Quincy and Focus this past year. Before we get there, just to heighten the anticipation, we should mention that it's a big job trying to get, uh, trying to look at all the stories that happened in 2017, narrow it down to 25, and then choose a number one story. So I think I've waited uh, long enough. Uh, the anticipation is building. What is number one? All right, well, 2017 marked the 30th and final large-scale Vietnam Veterans Remembrance Ceremony held at the Marina Bay Clock Tower. Organizers Larry Norton and Tom Belinda have worked tirelessly to remember their 48 fallen brethren. And this year, Quincy native General Joseph Dunford Jr., the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, gave the keynote address. The Vietnam generation never got to become the greatest generation no less brave than those who landed at Normandy or stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima, 
Vietnam veterans were denied the thanks of a grateful nation. But not now, not in Quincy, because of what we do here. It was neighborhood, church, family, and school reinforcing common values. It was Montclair, it was Atlantic, it was Squanum, it was Sacred Heart Church, it was all of these places that sat there and reinforced basic values plus a sense of humor. That's what we had in common. That's what they could not break. A communist enemy could not break that. And that's why we were able to return home with honor. We know the history, we know the story. They came home, they were not thanked. In some cases they were spat on, they were not respected. They never got their due. Well, Larry Norton, Tom Belinda and the gang have made sure that we in government that we in society and we in the city make sure they get their due and that's why we are here today. It is by far and away the single biggest way I can possibly think of that a man or a woman says I love my country and I am willing to do the ultimate thing I can do for my country. And their families are right there beside them from the time they choose to enlist until God willing, they come home. And events like this, moments like this, they give us all a chance to express the profound gratitude and appreciation that we had all better have for those people who are willing to take that chance and to stand up and serve. I'm also proud that the tradition of service here in, 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 uh, in Quincy continues. You know, tonight, or today, as, as we gather, there's about 300,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that are away from home in about 177 different countries. And as you know, many of those are in harm's way, and many of them for Quincy, Massachusetts. And in the audience today, and I met a few of them, are the parents of some of those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And I want to thank them for instilling in their children now they're young men and women, uh, the sense of sacrifice, the sense of service, and, and knowing that there is a responsibility that comes with being a citizen in this nation. And Our Vietnam veterans fought an unpopular war during a very turbulent time in our nation's history. And during a war, those who stepped forward to serve our country were often discredited in the media on campuses across the country by critics who actually confused policy with those that merely raised their right hand, swore to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States and implement that policy. When they came home, there weren't any speeches like there are today, there weren't any ceremonies and there weren't any parades. In patriotism and a sense of service and a sense of responsibility to our country, that wasn't something that was in such great favor in those days. We're here to remember our sons, our fathers, our brothers, our friends, and frankly, we're not really here to remember how they died. Remember. We're here to remember how they lived. And the fact that today that you have gathered for 48 young men that died some 50 years ago should be a civics lesson to the next generation of those from Quincy, Massachusetts. This is our last one. Uh, there's only two of us. Uh, we've done yeoman's work for these 48 young men, for the families. Um, So that's it. That's the top 25 stories covered on Quincy and Focus in 2017. And Mark, as always, we had a lot of people help us out on Quincy and Focus to put the pieces together, including a lot of great interns we had this past year too. We did from quite a few different colleges. So uh, they certainly assisted us uh, both in the field and uh, here in production. So we certainly uh, thank them for contributing to the top 25 stories. And if you're interested in helping us in 2018, we encourage you to do so. You can give us a call at 617-376-1440 or visit our website at qatv.org for more information. And you can become a part of Quincy Access TV in 2018. Well, for Mark Crosby, my name is Jonathan Clary. And for all the staff and board directors of Quincy Access Television, we hope you have a great new year and look forward to 2018.